Chapter thirty nine, part one of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, volume four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Brian Ness. After the fall of the Roman Empire in the West, an interval of fifty years, till the memorable reign of Justinian, is faintly marked by the obscure names and imperfect annals of Zeno, Anastasius, and Justin, who successively ascended to the throne of Constantinople. During the same period Italy revived and flourished under the government of a Gothic king, who might have deserved a statue among the best and bravest of the ancient Romans. Theodoric the Ostrogoth, the fourteenth and lineal descent of the royal line of the Amali, was born in the neighborhood of Vienna, two years after the death of Attila. Footnote 1. Jornandes has drawn the pedigree of Theodoric from Gapt, one of the Ansis, or demigods, who lived about the time of Domitian. Cassiodorus, the first who celebrates the royal race of the Amali, reckons the grandson of Theodoric as the seventeenth in descent. Perenskjold labors to connect this genealogy with the legends or traditions of his native country. Note, Amala was a name of hereditary sanctity and honor among the Visigoths. Footnote 2, regarding Theodoric's birth, more correctly on the banks of the Lake Pelso, near Carnuntum, almost on the same spot where Marcus Antoninus composed his meditations. A recent victory had restored the independence of the Ostrogoths, and the three brothers, Volomir, Theodomir, and Vidimir, who ruled that warlike nation with united councils, had separately pitched their habitations in the fertile though desolate province of Pannonia. The Huns still threatened their revolted subjects, but their hasty attack was repelled by the single forces of Volomir, and the news of his victory reached the distant camp of his brother in the same auspicious moment that the favorite concubine of Theodomir was delivered of a son and heir. In the eighth year of his age Theodoric was reluctantly yielded by his father to the public interest, as the pledge of an alliance which Leo, emperor of the East, had consented to purchase by an annual subsidy of three hundred pounds of gold. The royal hostage was educated at Constantinople with care and tenderness. His body was formed to all the exercises of war. His mind was expanded by the habits of liberal conversation. He frequented the schools of the most skillful masters. But he disdained or neglected the arts of Greece, and so ignorant did he always remain of the first elements of science, that a rude mark was contrived to represent the signature of the illiterate king of Italy. Footnote 3. The four first letters of his name were inscribed on a gold plate, and when it was fixed on the paper, the king drew his pen through the intervals. This authentic fact, with the testimony of Procopius, or at least of the contemporary Goths, far outweighs the vague praises of Enodius. Note. Lebeau and his commentator, Monsieur Saint-Martin, support, though with no very satisfactory evidence, the opposite opinion, but Lord Mahon urges the much stronger argument, the Byzantine education of Theodoric. As soon as he had attained the age of eighteen, he was restored to the wishes of the Ostrogoths, whom the emperor aspired to gain by liberality and confidence. Volomir had fallen in battle, the youngest of the brothers, Vidimir, had led away into Italy and Gaul an army of barbarians, and the whole nation acknowledged for their king the father of Theodoric. His ferocious subjects admired the strength and stature of the young prince, and he soon convinced them that he had not degenerated from the valor of his ancestors. At the head of six thousand volunteers, he secretly left the camp in quest of adventures, descended the Danube as far as Singidunum, or Belgrade, and soon returned to his father with the spoils of a Sarmatian king whom he had vanquished and slain. Such triumphs, however, were productive only of fame, and the invincible Ostrogoths were reduced to extreme distress by the want of clothing and food. They unanimously resolved to desert their Pannonian encampments, and boldly to advance into the warm and wealthy neighborhood of the Byzantine court, which already maintained in pride and luxury so many bands of confederate Goths. 
after proving by some acts of hostility that they could be dangerous or at least troublesome enemies the ostrogoths sold at a high price their reconciliation and fidelity accepted a donative of lands and money and were entrusted with the defence of the lower danube under the command of theodoric who succeeded after his father's death to the hereditary throne of the amali Footnote 5. The state of the Ostrogoths and the first years of Theodoric are found in Jornandes and Malchus, who erroneously styles him the son of Volimir. A hero descended from a race of kings must have despised the base Isarian who was invested with the Roman purple without any endowment of mind or body, without any advantage of royal birth or superior qualifications. After the failure of the Theodosian life, the choice of Placaria and of the Senate might be justified in some measure by the characters of Martin and Leo, but the latter of these princes confirmed and dishonored his reign by the perfidious murder of Aspar and his sons, who too rigorously exacted the debt of gratitude and obedience. The inheritance of Leo and of the East was peaceably devolved on his infant grandson, the son of his daughter Ariadne, and her Isarian husband, the fortunate Trascalicius, exchanged that barbarous sound for the Grecian appellation of Zeno. After the decease of the elder Leo, he approached with unnatural respect the throne of his son, humbly received as a gift the second rank in the empire, and soon excited the public suspicion on the sudden and premature death of his young colleague, whose life could no longer promote the success of his ambition. But the palace of Constantinople was ruled by female influence, and agitated by female passions, and Verena, the widow of Leo, claiming his empire as her own, pronounced a sentence of deposition against the worthless and ungrateful servant on whom she alone had bestowed the scepter of the East. Footnote 6. Theophanes inserts a copy of her sacred letters to the provinces. Such female pretensions would have astonished the slaves of the first Caesars. As soon as she sounded a revolt in the ears of Zeno, he fled with precipitation into the mountains of Isaria, and her brother Basiliscus, already infamous by his African expedition, was unanimously proclaimed by the servile senate. But the reign of the usurper was short and turbulent. Basiliscus presumed to assassinate the lover of his sister. He dared to offend the lover of his wife, the vain and insolent Harmatius, who, in the midst of Asiatic luxury, affected the dress, the demeanor, and the surname of Achilles. By the conspiracy of the malcontents, Zeno was recalled from exile, the armies, the capital, the person of Basiliscus, were betrayed, and his whole family was condemned to the long agony of cold and hunger by the inhuman conqueror, who wanted courage to encounter or to forgive his enemies. The haughty spirit of Verena was still incapable of submission or repose. She provoked the enmity of a favorite general, embraced his cause as soon as he was disgraced, created a new emperor in Syria and Egypt, raised an army of seventy thousand men, and persisted to the last moment of her life in a fruitless rebellion, which, according to the fashion of the age, had been predicted by Christian hermits and pagan magicians. While the East was afflicted by the passions of Verena, her daughter, Ariadne, was distinguished by the female virtues of mildness and fidelity. She followed her husband in his exile, and after his restoration she implored his clemency in favor of her mother. On the decease of Zeno, Ariadne, the daughter, the mother, and the widow of an emperor, gave her hand and the imperial title to Anastasius an aged domestic of the palace, who survived his elevation above twenty-seven years, and whose character is attested by the acclamation of the people, Reign as you have lived. Whatever fear of affection could bestow was profusely lavished by Zeno on the king of the Ostrogoths, the rank of patrician and consul, the command of the Palatine troops, an equestrian statue, a treasure in gold and silver of many thousand pounds, the name of son, and the promise of a rich and honorable wife. As long as Theodoric condescended to serve, he supported with courage and fidelity the cause of his benefactor. 
His rapid march contributed to the restoration of Zeno, and in the second revolt the Volumirs, as they were called, pursued and pressed the Asiatic rebels till they left an easy victory to the imperial troops. But the faithful servant was suddenly converted into a formidable enemy who spread the flames of war from Constantinople to the Adriatic. Many flourishing cities were reduced to ashes, and the agriculture of Thrace was almost extirpated by the wanton cruelty of the Goths, who deprived their captive peasants of the right hand that guided the plough. Footnote 11. This cruel practice is specially imputed to the Triarian Goths, less barbarous, as it should seem, than the Volumirs, but the son of Theodomir is charged with the ruin of many Roman cities. On such occasions Theodoric sustained the loud and specious reproach of disloyalty, of ingratitude, and of insatiate avarice, which could be only excused by the hard necessity of his situation. He reigned not as the monarch, but as the minister of a ferocious people, whose spirit was unbroken by slavery and impatient of real or imaginary insults. Their poverty was incurable, since the most liberal donatives were soon dissipated in wasteful luxury, and the most fertile estates became barren in their hands. They despised, but they envied, the laborious provincials, and when their subsistence had failed, the Ostrogoths embraced the familiar resources of war and rapine. It had been the wish of Theodoric, such at least was his declaration, to lead a peaceful, obscure, obedient life on the confines of Scythia, till the Byzantine court, by splendid and fallacious promises, seduced him to attack a confederate tribe of Goths, who had been engaged in the party of Basiliscus. He marched from his station in Mesia on the solemn assurance that before he reached Adrianople he should meet a plentiful convoy of provisions, and a reinforcement of eight thousand horse and thirty thousand foot, while the legions of Asia were encamped at Heraclea to second his operations. These measures were disappointed by mutual jealousy. As he advanced into Thrace, the son of Theodomir found an inhospitable solitude, and his Gothic followers, with a heavy train of horses, of mules, and of wagons, were betrayed by their guides among the rocks and precipices of Mount Sondus, where he was assaulted by the arms and invectives of Theodoric, the son of Triarius. From a neighboring height his artful rival harangued the camp of the Volumirs, and branded their leader with the opprobrious names of child, of madman, of perjured traitor, the enemy of his blood and nation. "'Are you ignorant,' exclaimed the son of Triarius, "'that it is the constant policy of the Romans to destroy the Goths by each other's swords?' Are you insensible that the victor in this unnatural contest will be exposed, and justly exposed, to their implacable revenge? Where are those warriors, my kinsmen, and thy own, whose widows now lament that their lives were sacrificed to thy rash ambition? Where is the wealth which thy soldiers possessed when they were first allured from their native homes to enlist under the standard? Each of them was then master of three or four horses. They now follow thee on foot, like slaves, through the deserts of Thrace. Those men who were tempted by the hope of measuring gold with a bushel, those brave men who are as free and as noble as thyself. A language so well suited to the temper of the Goths excited clamor and discontent, and the son of Theodomir, apprehensive of being left alone, was compelled to embrace his brethren and to imitate the example of Roman perfidy. Footnote. Gibbon has omitted much of the complicated intrigues of the Byzantine court with the two Theodorics. The weak emperor attempted to play them one against the other, and was himself in turn insulted, and the empire ravaged by both. The details of the successive alliance and revolt of hostility and of union between the two Gothic chieftains to dictate terms to the emperor may be found in Malchus. In every state of his fortune the prudence and firmness of Theodoric were equally conspicuous, whether he threatened Constantinople at the head of the confederate Goths, or retreated with a faithful band to the mountains and sea-coast of Epirus. 
At length the accidental death of the son of Triarius destroyed the balance which the Romans had been so anxious to preserve, the whole nation acknowledged the supremacy of the Amali, and the Byzantine court subscribed an ignominious and oppressive treaty. Footnote 13, in reference to the son of Triarius. As he was riding in his own camp, an unruly horse threw him against the point of a spear which hung before a tent, or was fixed on a wagon. The Senate had already declared that it was necessary to choose a party among the Goths, since the public was unequal to the support of their united forces. A subsidy of two thousand pounds of gold, with the ample pay of thirteen thousand men, were required for the least considerable of their armies and the Isaurians, who guarded not the empire but the emperor, enjoyed, besides the privilege of rapine, an annual pension of five thousand pounds. The sagacious mind of Theodoric soon perceived that he was odious to the Romans, and suspected by the barbarians. He understood the popular murmur, that his subjects were exposed in their frozen huts to intolerable hardships, while their king was dissolved in the luxury of Greece, and he prevented the painful alternative of encountering the Goths, as the champion, or of leading them in the field, as the enemy of Zeno. Embracing an enterprise worthy of his courage and ambition, Theodoric addressed the emperor in the following words, Although your servant is maintained in affluence by your liberality, graciously listen to the wishes of my heart, Italy, the inheritance of your predecessors, and Rome itself, the head and mistress of the world, now fluctuate under the violence and oppression of Odoacer, the mercenary. Direct me, with my national troops, to march against the tyrant. If I fall, you will be relieved from an expensive and troublesome friend. If, with the divine permission, I succeed, I shall govern in your name, and to your glory, the Roman Senate, and the part of the Republic delivered from slavery by my victorious arms. The proposal of Theodoric was accepted, and perhaps had been suggested, by the Byzantine court, but the forms of the commission, or grant, appear to have been expressed with a prudent ambiguity, which might be explained by the event, and it was left doubtful whether the conqueror of Italy should reign as the lieutenant, the vassal, or the ally of the emperor of the East. The reputation both of the leader and of the war diffused a universal ardor. The Volumirs were multiplied by the Gothic swarms already engaged in the service, or seated in the provinces of the empire, and each bold barbarian who had heard of the wealth and beauty of Italy was impatient to seek, through the most perilous adventures, the possession of such enchanting objects. The march of Theodoric must be considered as the emigration of an entire people, the wives and children of the Goths, their aged parents, and most precious effects, were carefully transported, and some idea may be formed of the heavy baggage that now followed the camp by the loss of two thousand wagons, which had been sustained in a single action in the War of Epirus. For their subsistence the Goths depended on the magazines of corn, which was ground in portable mills by the hands of their women, on the milk and flesh of their flocks and herds, on the casual produce of the chase, and upon the contributions which they might impose on all who should presume to dispute the passage, or to refuse their friendly assistance. Notwithstanding these precautions, they were exposed to the danger and almost to the distress of famine in a march of seven hundred miles which had been undertaken in the depth of a rigorous winter. Since the fall of the Roman power, Dacia and Pannonia no longer exhibited the rich prospect of populous cities, well-cultivated fields, and convenient highways. The reign of barbarism and desolation was restored, and the tribes of Bulgarians, Gepidae, and Sarmatians, who had occupied the vacant province, were prompted by their native fierceness or the solicitations of Odoacer to resist the progress of his enemy. In many obscure, though bloody battles, Theodoric fought and vanquished, till at length, surmounting every obstacle by skillful conduct and persevering courage, he descended from the Julian Alps and displayed his invincible banners on the confines of Italy." Footnote 17. Theodoric's march is supplied and illustrated by Anodius, when the bombast of the oration is translated into the language of common sense. 
Odoacer, a rival not unworthy of his arms, had already occupied the advantageous and well-known post of the river Sontius, near the ruins of Aquileia, at the head of a powerful host whose independent kings or leaders disdained the duties of subordination and the prudence of delays. No sooner had Theodoric gained a short repose and refreshment to his wearied cavalry then he boldly attacked the fortifications of the enemy. The Ostrogoths showed more ardor to acquire than the mercenaries to defend the lands of Italy, and the reward of the first victory was the possession of the Venetian province as far as the walls of Verona. In the neighborhood of that city, on the steep banks of the rapid Adige, he was opposed by a new army, reinforced in its numbers and not impaired in its courage the contest was more obstinate but the event was still more decisive odoacer fled to ravenna theodoric advanced to milan and the vanquished troops saluted their conqueror with loud acclamations of respect and fidelity but their want either of constancy or of faith soon exposed him to the most imminent danger his vanguard with several gothic counts which had been rashly entrusted to a deserter, was betrayed and destroyed near Fenza by his double treachery. Odoacer again appeared, master of the field, and the invader, strongly entrenched in his camp of Pavia, was reduced to solicit the aid of a kindred nation, the Visigoths of Gaul. In the course of this history the most voracious appetite for war will be abundantly satiated, nor can I much lament that our dark and imperfect materials do not afford a more ample narrative of the distress of Italy, and of the fierce conflict which was finally decided by the abilities, experience, and valor of the Gothic king. Immediately before the Battle of Verona he visited the tent of his mother and sister, and requested that on a day, the most illustrious festival of his life, they would adorn him with the rich garments which they had worked with their own hands. "'Our glory,' said he, "'is mutual and inseparable. You are known to the world as the mother of Theodoric, and it becomes me to prove that I am the genuine offspring of those heroes from whom I claim my descent. The wife or concubine of Theodomir was inspired with the spirit of the German matrons who esteemed their son's honor far above their safety, and it is reported that in a desperate action, when Theodoric himself was hurried along by the torrent of a flying crowd, she boldly met them at the entrance of the camp, and by her generous reproaches drove them back on the swords of the enemy. Footnote 20. This anecdote is related in the modern but respectable authority of Sigonius. His words are curious. Would you return? etc. She presented and almost displayed the original recess. Note. The authority of Sigonius would scarcely have weighed with Gibbon except for an indecent anecdote. I have a recollection of a similar story in some of the Italian wars. From the Alps to the extremity of Calabria, Theodoric reigned by the right of conquest. The Vandal ambassadors surrendered the island of Sicily as a lawful appendage of his kingdom, and he was accepted as the deliverer of Rome by the Senate and the people, who had shut their gates against the flying usurper. Ravenna alone, secure in the fortifications of art and nature, still sustained a siege of almost three years, and the daring sallies of Odoacer carried slaughter and dismay into the Gothic camp. At length, destitute of provisions and hopeless of relief, that unfortunate monarch yielded to the groans of his subjects and the clamors of his soldiers. A treaty of peace was negotiated by the bishop of Ravenna. The Ostrogoths were admitted into the city, and the hostile kings consented under the sanction of an oath to rule with equal and undivided authority the provinces of Italy. The event of such an agreement may be easily foreseen. After some days had been devoted to the semblance of joy and friendship, Odoacer, in the midst of a solemn banquet, was stabbed by the hand, or at least by the command, of his rival. Secret and effectual orders had been previously dispatched. The faithless and rapacious mercenaries, at the same moment and without trace, were universally massacred, and the royalty of Theodoric was proclaimed by the Goths, with the tardy, reluctant, ambiguous consent of the Emperor of the East. 
the design of a conspiracy was imputed according to the usual forms to the prostrate tyrant but his innocence and the guilt of his conqueror are sufficiently proved by the advantageous treaty which force would not sincerely have granted nor weakness have rashly infringed the jealousy of power and the mischiefs of discord may suggest a more decent apology and a sentence less rigorous may be pronounced against a crime which was necessary to introduce into Italy a generation of public felicity. The living author of this felicity was audaciously praised in his own presence by sacred and profane orators, but history, in his time she was mute and inglorious, has not left any just representation of the events which displayed or of the defects which clouded the virtues of Theodoric one record of his fame the volume of public epistles composed by cassiodorus in the royal name is still extant and has obtained more implicit credit than it seems to deserve they exhibit the forms rather than the substance of his government and we should vainly search for the pure and spontaneous sentiments of the barbarian amidst the declamation and learning of a sophist the wishes of a roman senator the precedence of office and the vague professions which in every court and on every occasion compose the language of discreet ministers the reputation of theodoric may repose with more confidence on the visible peace and prosperity of a reign of thirty-three years the unanimous esteem of his own times and the memory of his wisdom and courage his justice and humanity which was deeply impressed on the minds of the goths and italians the partition of the lands of italy of which theodoric assigned the third part to his soldiers is honorably arraigned as the sole injustice of his life footnote monzo observes that this division was conducted not in a violent and irregular but in a legal and orderly manner the barbarian who could not show a title of grant from the officers of theodoric appointed for the purpose or a prescriptive right of thirty years, in case he had obtained the property before the Ostrogothic conquest, was ejected from the estate. He conceives that estates too small to bear division paid a third of their produce. And even this act may be fairly justified by the example of Odoacer, the rights of conquest, the true interest of the Italians, and the sacred duty of subsisting a whole people who on faith of his promises, had transported themselves into a distant land. Footnote 26. Uh, Procopius exaggerates the injustice of the Goths, whom he hated as an Italian noble. The plebeian muratori crouches under their oppression. Under the reign of Theodoric, and in the happy climate of Italy, the Goths soon multiplied to a formidable host of two hundred thousand men, and the whole amount of their families may be computed by the ordinary addition of women and children. Their invasion of property, a part of which must have been already vacant, was disguised by the generous but improper name of hospitality. These unwelcome guests were irregularly dispersed over the face of Italy, and the lot of each barbarian was adequate to his birth and office, the number of his followers, and the rustic wealth which he possessed in slaves and cattle. The distinction of noble and plebeian were acknowledged, but the lands of every freeman were exempt from taxes, and he enjoyed the inestimable privilege of being subject only to the laws of his country. Footnote 28. When Theodoric gave his sister to the king of the Vandals, she sailed for Africa with a guard of one thousand noble Goths, each of whom was attended by five armed followers. The Gothic nobility must have been as numerous as brave. Fashions and even convenience soon persuaded the conquerors to assume the more elegant dress of the natives, but they still persisted in the use of their mother tongue, and their contempt for the Latin schools was applauded by Theodoric himself, who gratified their prejudices or his own by declaring that the child who had trembled at a rod would never dare to look upon a sword. Footnote 30 the roman boys learnt the language of the goths their general ignorance is not destroyed by the exceptions of amalasuntha a female who might study without shame or of theodotus whose learning provoked the indignation and contempt of his countrymen 
Distress might sometimes provoke the indigent Roman to assume the ferocious manners which were insensibly relinquished by the rich and luxurious barbarian, but these mutual conversions were not encouraged by the policy of a monarch who perpetuated the separation of the Italians and Goths, reserving the former for the acts of peace and the latter for the service of war. To accomplish this design, he studied to protect his industrious subjects, and to moderate the violence, without enervating the valor, of his soldiers, who were maintained for the public defense. They held their lands and benefices as a military stipend. At the sound of the trumpet they were prepared to march under the conduct of their provincial officers, and the whole extent of Italy was distributed into the several quarters of a well-regulated camp. The service of the palace and of the frontiers was performed by choice or by rotation, and each extraordinary fatigue was recompensed by an increase of pay and occasional donatives. Theodoric had convinced his brave companions that empire must be acquired and defended by the same arts. After his example, they strove to excel in the use not only of the lance and sword, the instruments of their victories, but of the missile weapons, which they were too much inclined to neglect. And the lively image of war was displayed in the daily exercise and annual reviews of the Gothic cavalry. A firm, though gentle, discipline imposed the habits of modesty, obedience, and temperance, and the Goths were instructed to spare the people, to reverence the laws, to understand the duties of civil society, and to disclaim the barbarous license of judicial combat and private revenge. End of chapter 39, part 1《ชั่วโมง39》ในบทที่39ของการลงทุนของเมืองโรมในช่วงศตวรรษที่16นี้นี่คือบทเรียนที่ดีที่สุดของการลงทุนในช่วงศตวรรษที่16ของโรมในช่วงศตวรรษที่16ของโรมในช่วงศตวรรษที่16ของโรมในช่วงศตวรรษที่16ของโรมในช่วงศตวรรษที่16ของโรมในช่วงศตวรรษที่16ของโรมในช่วงศตวรรษที่16ของโรมในช่วงศตวรรษที่16ของโรมในช่วงศตวรรษที่16ของโรม But as soon as it appeared that he was satisfied with conquest and desirous of peace, terror was changed into respect, and they submitted to a powerful mediation, which was uniformly employed for the best purposes of reconciling their quarrels and civilizing their manners. The ambassadors who resorted to Ravenna from the most distant countries of Europe admired his wisdom, magnificence, and courtesy. And if he sometimes accepted either slaves or arms, white horses or strange animals. The gift of a sundial, a water clock, or a musician, admonished even the princes of Gaul of the superior art and industry of his Italian subjects. His domestic alliances—a wife, two daughters, a sister, and a niece—united the family of Theodoric with the kings of the Franks, the Burgundians, the Visigoths, the Vandals, and the Thuringians, and contributed to maintain the harmony, or at least the balance, of the great republic of the West. It is difficult in the dark forests of Germany and Poland to pursue the immigrations of the Heruli, a fierce people who disdained the use of armor, and who condemned their widows and aged parents not to survive the loss of their husbands or the decay of their strength. The king of these savage warriors solicited the friendship of Theodoric, and was elevated to the rank of his son according to the barbaric rites of military adoption. From the shores of the Baltic. The Estians or Livonians laid their offerings of native amber at the feet of a prince, whose fame had excited them to undertake an unknown and dangerous journey of fifteen hundred miles. With the country from whence the Gothic nation derived their origin, he maintained a frequent and friendly correspondence. The Italians were clothed in the rich sables of Sweden, and one of its sovereigns, after a voluntary or reluctant abdication, found a hospitable retreat in the palace of Ravenna. He had reigned over one of thirteen populous tribes who cultivated the small portion of the great island or peninsula of Scandinavia, to which the vague appellation of Thule has been sometimes applied. The northern region was peopled, 
or had been explored as high as the sixty-eighth degree of latitude, where the natives of the polar circle enjoy and lose the presence of the sun at each summer and winter solstice during an equal period of forty days. The long night of his absence or death was the mournful season of distress and anxiety, till the messengers who had been sent to the mountain tops descried the first rays of returning light and proclaimed to the plain below the festival of his resurrection. The life of Theodoric represents the rare and meritorious example of a barbarian who sheathed his sword in the pride of victory and the vigor of his age. A reign of three and thirty years was consecrated to the duties of civil government, and the hostilities in which he was sometimes involved were speedily terminated by the conduct of his lieutenants, the discipline of his troops, the arms of his allies, and even the terror of his name. He reduced under a strong and regular government the unprofitable countries of Raetia, Noricum, Dalmatia, and Pannonia, from the source of the Danube and the territory of the Bavarians, to the petty kingdom erected by the Gepidae on the ruins of Sirmium. His prudence could not safely entrust the bulwark of Italy to such feeble and turbulent neighbors, and his justice might claim the lands which they oppressed, either as a part of his kingdom, or as the inheritance of his father. The greatness of a servant, who was named perfidious because he was successful, awakened the jealousy of the emperor Anastasius, and a war was kindled on the Dacian frontier, by the protection which the Gothic king, in the vicissitude of human affairs, had granted to one of the descendants of Attila. Sabinian, a general illustrious by his own and father's merit, advanced at the head of ten thousand Romans, and the provisions and arms which filled a long train of wagons were distributed to the fiercest of the Bulgarian tribes. But in the fields of Margus, the eastern powers were defeated by the inferior forces of the Goths and Huns. The flower and even the hope of the Roman armies was irretrievably destroyed, and such was the temperance with which Theodoric had inspired his victorious troops, that, as their leader had not given the sign of pillage, the rich spoils of the enemy lay untouched at their feet. Exasperated by this disgrace, the Byzantine court dispatched two hundred ships and eight thousand men to plunder the seacoast of Calabria and Apulia. They assaulted the ancient city of Tarentum, interrupted the trade and agriculture of a happy country, and sailed back to the Hellespont, proud of their piratical victory over a people whom they still presumed to consider as their Roman brethren. Their retreat was possibly hastened by the activity of Theodoric. Italy was covered by a fleet of a thousand light vessels, which he constructed with incredible dispatch, and his firm moderation was soon rewarded by a solid and honorable peace. He maintained with a powerful hand the balance of the West, till it was at length overthrown by the ambition of Clovis, and although unable to assist his rash and unfortunate kinsman, the king of the Visigoths, he saved the remains of his family and people, and checked the Franks in the midst of their victorious career. I am not desirous to prolong or repeat this narrative of military events, the least interesting of the reign of Theodoric, and shall be content to add that the Alemanni were protected, that an inroad of the Burgundians was severely chastised, and that the conquest of Arles and Marseilles opened a free communication with the Visigoths, who revered him as their national protector, and as the guardian of his grandchild, the infant son of Alaric. Under this respectable character, the king of Italy restored the Praetorian prefecture of the Gauls, reformed some abuses in the civil government of Spain, and accepted the annual tribute and apparent submission of its military governor, who wisely refused to trust his person in the palace of Ravenna. The Gothic sovereignty was established from Sicily to the Danube, from Sirmium or Belgrade to the Atlantic Ocean, and the Greeks themselves have acknowledged that Theodoric reigned over the fairest portion of the Western Empire. The union of the Goths and Romans might have fixed for ages the transient happiness of Italy, and the first of nations, a new people of free subjects and enlightened soldiers, might have gradually arisen from the mutual emulation of their respective virtues. But the sublime merit of guiding or seconding such a revolution was not reserved for the reign of Theodoric. He wanted either the genius or the opportunities of a legislator and while he indulged the Goths in the enjoyment of rude liberty, he servilely copied the institutions and even the abuses of the political system which had been framed by Constantine and his successors. From a tender regard to the expiring prejudices of Rome, the barbarian declined the name, the purple, and the diadem of the emperors, but he assumed under the hereditary title of king 
the whole substance and plenitude of imperial prerogative. His addresses to the eastern throne were respectful and ambiguous. He celebrated in pompous style the harmony of the two republics, applauded his own government as the perfect similitude of a sole and undivided empire, and claimed above the kings of the earth the same preeminence which he modestly allowed to the person or rank of Anastasius. The alliance of the East and West was annually declared by the unanimous choice of two consuls, but it should seem that the Italian candidate, who was named by Theodoric, accepted a formal confirmation from the sovereign of Constantinople. The Gothic palace of Ravenna reflected the image of the court of Theodosius of Valentinian. The Praetorian prefect, the prefect of Rome, the quaestor, the master of the offices, with the public and patrimonial treasurers, whose functions are painted in gaudy colors by the rhetoric of Cassiodorus, still continued to act as the ministers of state. And the subordinate care of justice and the revenue was delegated to seven consulars, three correctors, and five presidents, who governed the fifteen regions of Italy according to the principles and even the forms of Roman jurisprudence. The violence of the conquerors was abated or eluded by the slow artifice of judicial proceedings. The civil administration, with its honors and emoluments, was confined to the Italians, and the people still preserved their dress and language, their laws and customs, their personal freedom, and two-thirds of their landed property. It had been the object of Augustus to conceal the introduction of monarchy. It was the policy of Theodoric to disguise the reign of a barbarian. If his subjects were sometimes awakened from this pleasing vision of a Roman government, they derived more substantial comfort from the character of a Gothic prince, who had penetration to discern and firmness to pursue his own and the public interest. Theodoric loved the virtues which he possessed, and the talents of which he was destitute. Tiberius was promoted to the office of Praetorian Prefect for his unshaken fidelity to the unfortunate cause of Odoacer. The ministers of Theodoric, Cassiodorus, and Boethius have reflected on his reign the luster of their genius and learning. More prudent or more fortunate than his colleague, Cassiodorus preserved his own esteem without forfeiting the royal favor, and after passing thirty years in the honors of the world, he was blessed with an equal term of repose in the devout and studious solitude of Squillace. As the patron of the Republic, it was the interest and duty of the Gothic king to cultivate the affections of the Senate and the people. The nobles of Rome were flattered by sonorous epithets and formal professions of respect, which had been more justly applied to the merit and authority of their ancestors. The people enjoyed, without fear or danger, the three blessings of a capital, order, plenty, and public amusements. A visible diminution of their numbers may be found even in the measure of liberality. Yet Apulia, Calabria, and Sicily poured their tributes of corn into the granaries of Rome, an allowance of bread and meat was distributed to the indigent citizens, and every office was deemed honorable, which was consecrated to the care of their health and happiness. The public games, such as the Greek ambassador might politely applaud, exhibited a faint and feeble copy of the magnificence of the Caesars. Yet the musical, the gymnastic, and the pantomime arts had not totally sunk in oblivion. The wild beasts of Africa still exercised in the amphitheater the courage and dexterity of the hunters, and the indulgent goth either patiently tolerated or gently restrained the blue and green factions whose contests so often filled the circus with clamor and even with blood. In the seventh year of his peaceful reign, Theodoric visited the old capital of the world. The senate and people advanced in solemn procession to salute a second Trajan, a new Valentinian, and he nobly supported that character by the assurance of a just and legal government, in a discourse which he was not afraid to pronounce in public, and to inscribe on a tablet of brass. Rome, in this august ceremony, shot a last ray of declining glory, and a saint, the spectator of this pompous scene, could only hope in his pious fancy that it was excelled by the celestial splendor of the new Jerusalem. During a residence of six months, the fame, the person, and the courteous demeanor of the Gothic king excited the admiration of the Romans, 
and he contemplated with equal curiosity and surprise the monuments that remained of their ancient greatness. He imprinted the footsteps of a conqueror on the Capitoline Hill, and frankly confessed that each day he viewed with fresh wonder the Forum of Traja and his lofty column. The theatre of Pompeii appeared, even in its decay, as a huge mountain artificially hollowed and polished and adorned by human industry, and he vaguely computed that a river of gold must have been drained to erect the colossal amphitheatre of Titus. From the mouths of fourteen aqueducts, a pure and copious stream was diffused into every part of the city, among these the Claudian water, which arose at the distance of thirty-eight miles in the Sabine mountains, was conveyed along a gentle though constant declivity of solid arches till it descended on the summit of the Aventine hill. The long and spacious vaults, which had been constructed for the purpose of common sewers, subsisted after twelve centuries in their pristine strength, and these subterraneous channels have been preferred to all the visible wonders of Rome. The Gothic kings, so injuriously accused of the ruin of antiquity, were anxious to preserve the monuments of the nation whom they had subdued. The royal edicts were framed to prevent the abuses, the neglect, or the depredations of the citizens themselves, and the professed architect, the annual sum of two hundred pounds of gold, twenty-five thousand tiles, and the receipt of customs from the Lucrine port were assigned for the ordinary repairs of the walls and public edifices. A similar care was extended to the statues of metal or marble, of man or animals. The spirit of the horses, which have given a modern name to the Quirinal, was applauded by the barbarians. The brazen elephants of the Via Sacra were diligently restored. The famous heifer of Muron deceived the cattle, as they were driven through the Forum of Peace, and an officer was created to protect those works of red which Theodoric considered as the noblest ornaments of his kingdom. End of chapter 39, part 2
and the Pomptine marshes, as well as those of Spoleto, were drained and cultivated by private undertakers, whose distant reward must depend on the continuance of the public prosperity. Whenever the seasons were less propitious, the doubtful precautions of forming magazines of corn, fixing the price, and prohibiting the export, attested at least the benevolence of the state. But such was the extraordinary plenty which an industrious people produced from a grateful soil, that a gallon of wine was sometimes sold in Italy for less than three farthings, and a quarter of wheat at about five shillings and sixpence. A country possessed of so many valuable objects of exchange soon attracted the merchants of the world, whose beneficial traffic was encouraged and protected by the liberal spirit of Theodoric. The free intercourse of the provinces by land and water was restored and extended. The city gates were never shut either by day or by night, and the common saying that a purse of gold might be safely left in the fields was expressive of the conscious security of the inhabitants. A difference of religion is always pernicious, and often fatal, to the harmony of the prince and people. The Gothic conqueror had been educated in the profession of Arianism, and Italy was devoutly attached to the Nicene faith. But the persecution of Theodoric was not infected by zeal, and he piously adhered to the hearsay of his fathers, without condescending to balance the subtle arguments of theological metaphysics. Satisfied with the private toleration of his Arian sectaries, he justly conceived himself to be the guardian of the public worship, and his external reverence for a superstition which he despised may have nourished in his mind the salutary indifference of a statesman or philosopher. The Catholics of his dominions acknowledged, perhaps with reluctance, the peace of the Church. Their clergy, according to the degrees of rank or merit, were honorably entertained in the palace of Theodoric. He esteemed the living sanctity of Caesarius and Epiphanius, the orthodox bishops of Arles and Pavia, and presented a decent offering on the tomb of St. Peter, without any scrupulous inquiry into the creed of the apostle. His favorite Goths, and even his mother, were permitted to retain or embrace the Athanasian faith, and his long reign could not afford the example of an Italian Catholic, who, either from choice or compulsion, had deviated into the religion of the conqueror. The people and the barbarians themselves were edified by the pomp and order of religious worship. The magistrates were instructed to defend the just immunities of ecclesiastical persons and possessions. The bishops held their synods, the metropolitans exercised their jurisdiction, and the privileges of sanctuary were maintained or moderated according to the spirit of Roman jurisprudence. With a protection, Theodoric assumed the legal supremacy of the Church, and his firm administration restored or extended some useful prerogatives which had been neglected by the feeble emperors of the West. He was not ignorant of the dignity and importance of the Roman pontiff, to whom the venerable name of Pope was now appropriated. The peace or the revolt of Italy might depend on the character of a wealthy and popular bishop, who claimed such ample dominion both in heaven and earth, who had been declared in a numerous synod to be pure from all sin and exempt from all judgment. When the chair of St. Peter was disputed by Symmachus and Lawrence, they appeared at his summons before the tribunal of an Arian monarch, and he confirmed the election of the most worthy or the most obsequious candidate. At the end of his life, in a moment of jealousy and resentment, he prevented the choice of the Romans by nominating a pope in the palace of Ravenna. The danger and furious contests of a schism were mildly restrained, and the last decree of the Senate was enacted to extinguish, if it were possible, the scandalous finality of the papal elections. I have descanted with pleasure on the fortunate condition of Italy, but our fancy must not hastily conceive that the golden age of the poets, a race of men without vice or misery, was realized under the Gothic conquest. The fair prospect was sometimes overcast with clouds. The wisdom of Theodoric might be deceived, his power might be resisted, and the declining age of the monarch was sullied with popular hatred and patrician blood. In the first insolence of victory, he had been tempted to deprive the whole party of Odoacer of the civil and even the natural rights of society. 
a tax unseasonably imposed after the calamities of war, would have crushed the rising agriculture of Liguria. A rigid preemption of corn, which was intended for the public relief, must have aggravated the distress of Campania. These dangerous projects were defeated by the virtue and eloquence of Epiphanius and Boethius, who, in the presence of Theodoric himself, successfully pleaded the cause of the people. But if the royal ear was open to the voice of truth, a saint and a philosopher are not always to be found at the ear of kings. The privileges of rank, or office, or favor, were too frequently abused by Italian fraud and Gothic violence, and the avarice of the king's nephew was publicly exposed, at first by the usurpation, and afterwards by the restitution, of the estates which he had unjustly extorted from his Tuscan neighbors. Two hundred thousand barbarians, formidable even to their master, were seated in the heart of Italy. They indignantly supported the restraints of peace and discipline. The disorders of their march were always felt, and sometimes compensated. And where it was dangerous to punish, it might be prudent to dissemble the sallies of their native fierceness. When the indulgence of Theodoric had remitted two-thirds of the Ligurian tribute, he condescended to explain the difficulties of his situation, and to lament the heavy though inevitable burdens which he imposed on his subjects for their own defense. These ungrateful subjects could never be cordially reconciled to the origin, the religion, or even the virtues of the Gothic conqueror. Past calamities were forgotten, and the sense or suspicion of injuries was rendered still more exquisite by the present felicity of the times. Even the religious toleration which Theodoric had the glory of introducing into the Christian world was painful and offensive to the orthodox zeal of the Italians. They respected the armed heresy of the Goths, but their pious rage was safely pointed against the rich and defenseless Jews, who had formed their establishments at Naples, Rome, Ravenna, Milan, and Genoa, for the benefit of trade and under the sanction of the laws. Their persons were insulted, their effects were pillaged, and their synagogues were burned by the mad populace of Ravenna and Rome, inflamed, as it should seem, by the most frivolous or extravagant pretenses. The government which could neglect would have deserved such an outrage. A legal inquiry was instantly directed, and as the authors of the tumult had escaped in the crowd, the whole community was condemned to repair the damage and the obstinate bigots, who refused their contributions, were whipped through the streets by the hand of the executioner. This simple act of justice exasperated the discontent of the Catholics, who applauded the merit and patience of these holy confessors. Three hundred pulpits deplored the persecution of the church, and if the chapel of St. Stephen at Verona was demolished by the command of Theodoric, it is probable that some miracle hostile to his name and dignity had been performed on that sacred theater. At the close of a glorious life, the king of Italy discovered that he had excited the hatred of a people whose happiness he had so assiduously labored to promote, and his mind was soured by indignation, jealousy, and the bitterness of unrequited love. The Gothic conqueror condescended to disarm the unwarlike natives of Italy, interdicting all weapons of offense, and accepting only a small knife for domestic use. The deliverer of Rome was accused of conspiring with the vilest informers against the lives of senators, whom he suspected of a secret and treasonable correspondence with the Byzantine court. After the death of Anastasius, the diadem had been placed on the head of a feeble old man, but the powers of government were assumed by his nephew Justinian, who already meditated the extirpation of Hirsi and the conquest of Italy and Africa. A rigorous law, which was published at Constantinople, to reduce the Arians by the dread of punishment within the pale of the church, awakened the just resentment of Theodoric, who claimed for his distressed brethren of the East the same indulgence which he had so long granted to the Catholics of his dominion. At his stern command, the Roman pontiff, with four illustrious senators, embarked on an embassy of which he must have alike dreaded the failure or the success. 
the singular veneration shown to the first pope who had visited Constantinople, was punished as a crime by his jealous monarch. The artful or peremptory refusal of the Byzantine court might excuse an equal and would provoke a larger measure of retaliation, and a mandate was prepared in Italy to prohibit, after a stated day, the exercise of the Catholic worship. By the bigotry of his subjects and enemies, the most tolerant of princes was driven to the brink of persecution, and the life of Theodoric was too long, since he lived to condemn the virtue of Boethius and Symmachus. The senator Boethius is the last of the Romans whom Cato or Tully could have acknowledged for their countryman. As a wealthy orphan, he inherited the patrimony and honors of the Anician family, a name ambitiously assumed by the kings and emperors of the age, and the appellation of Manlius asserted his genuine or fabulous descent from a race of consuls and dictators, who had repulsed the Gauls from the capital and sacrificed their sons to the discipline of the Republic. In the youth of Boethius, the studies of Rome were not totally abandoned. A Virgil is now extant, corrected by the hand of a consul, and the professors of grammar, rhetoric, and jurisprudence were maintained in their privileges and pensions by the liberality of the Goths. But the erudition of the Latin language was insufficient to satiate his ardent curiosity, and Boethius is said to have employed eighteen laborious years in the schools of Athens, which were supported by the zeal, the learning, and the diligence of Proclus and his disciples. The reason and piety of their Roman pupil were fortunately saved from the contagion of mystery and magic, which polluted the groves of the academy, but he imbibed the spirit and imitated the method of his dead and living masters, who attempted to reconcile the strong and subtle sense of Aristotle with the devout contemplation and sublime fancy of Plato. After his return to Rome, and his marriage with the daughter of his friend, the patrician Symmachus, Boethius still continued, in a palace of ivory and marble, to prosecute the same studies. The church was edified by his profound defense of the orthodox creed against the Arian, the Eutychian, and the Nestorian heresies, and the Catholic unity was explained or exposed in a formal treatise by the indifference of three distinct, though consubstantial, persons. For the benefit of his Latin readers, his genius submitted to teach the first elements of the arts and sciences of Greece. The geometry of Euclid, the music of Pythagoras, the arithmetic of Nicomachus, the mechanics of Archimedes, the astronomy of Ptolemy, the theology of Plato, and the logic of Aristotle with the commentary of Porphyry, were translated and illustrated by the indefatigable pen of the Roman senator and he alone was esteemed capable of describing the wonders of art, a sundial, a water clock, or a sphere which represented the motions of the planets. From these abstruse speculations, Boethius stooped, or to speak more truly, he rose to the social duties of public and private life. The indigent were relieved by his liberality and his eloquence, which flattery might compare to the voice of Demosthenes or Cicero was uniformly exerted in the cause of innocence and humanity. Such conspicuous merit was felt and rewarded by a discerning prince. The dignity of Boethius was adorned with the titles of consul and patrician, and his talents were usefully employed in the important station of master of the offices. Notwithstanding the equal claims of the East and West, his two sons were created, in their tender youth, the consuls of the same year. On the memorable day of their inauguration, they proceeded in solemn pomp from their palace to the forum amidst the applause of the senate and people, and their joyful father, the true consul of Rome, after pronouncing an oration in the praise of his royal benefactor, distributed a triumphal largess in the games of the circus. Prosperous in his fame and fortunes, in his public honors and private alliances, in the cultivation of science and the consciousness of virtue, Boethius might have been styled happy if that precarious epithet could be safely applied before the last term of the life of man. A philosopher, liberal of his wealth 
and parsimonious of his time, might be insensible to the common allurements of ambition, the thirst of gold and employment. And some credit may be due to the asservation of Boethius, that he had reluctantly obeyed the divine Plato, who enjoins every virtuous citizen to rescue the state from the usurpation of vice and ignorance. For the integrity of his public conduct, he appeals to the memory of his country. His authority had restrained the pride and oppression of the royal officers, and his eloquence had delivered Polyanus from the dogs of the palace. He had always pitied, and often relieved, the distress of the provincials, whose fortunes were exhausted by public and private rapine, and Boethius alone had courage to oppose the tyranny of the barbarians, elated by conquest, excited by avarice, and, as he complains, encouraged by impunity. In these honorable contests his spirit soared above the consideration of danger, and perhaps prudence. And we may learn from the example of Cato, that a character of pure and inflexible virtue is the most apt to be misled by prejudice, to be heeded by enthusiasm, and to confound private enemies with public justice. The disciple of Plato might exaggerate the infirmities of nature and the imperfections of society, and the mildest form of a Gothic kingdom, even the weight of allegiance and gratitude, must be insupportable to the free spirit of a Roman patriot. But the favor and fidelity of Boethius declined in just proportion with the public happiness, and an unworthy colleague was imposed to divide and control the power of the master of the offices. In the last gloomy season of Theodoric, he indignantly felt that he was a slave, but as his master had only power over his life, he stood without arms and without fear against the face of an angry barbarian, who had been provoked to believe that the safety of the Senate was incompatible with his own. The senator Albinus was accused and already convicted on the presumption of hoping, as it was said, the liberty of Rome. If Albinus be criminal, exclaimed the orator, the senate and myself are all guilty of the same crime. If we are innocent, Albinus is equally entitled to the protection of the laws. These laws might not have punished the simple and barren wish of an unattainable blessing, but they would have shown less indulgence to the rash confession of Boethius, that had he known of a conspiracy, the tyrant never should. The advocate of Albinus was soon involved in the danger and perhaps the guilt of his client. Their signature, which they denied as a forgery, was affixed to the original address, inviting the emperor to, to deliver Italy from the Goths. And three witnesses of honorable rank, perhaps of infamous reputation, attested the treasonable designs of the Roman patrician. Yet his innocence must be presumed, since he was deprived by Theodoric of the means of justification, and rigorously confined in the Tower of Pavia, while the Senate, at the distance of five hundred miles, pronounced a sentence of confiscation and death against the most illustrious of its members. At the command of the barbarians, the occult science of a philosopher was stigmatized with the names of sacrilege and magic. A devout and dutiful attachment to the Senate was condemned as criminal by the trembling voices of the senators themselves, and their ingratitude deserved the wish or prediction of Boethius that after him none should be found guilty of the same offense. While Boethius, oppressed with fetters, expected each moment the sentence or the stroke of death, he composed, in the Tower of Pavia, the Consolation of Philosophy, a golden volume not unworthy of the leisure of Plato or Tully, but which claims incomparable merit from the barbarism of the times and the situation of the author. The celestial guide, whom he had so long invoked at Rome and Athens, now condescended to illuminate his dungeon, to revive his courage, and to pour into his wounds her salutary balm. She taught him to compare his long prosperity and his recent distress, and to conceive new hopes from the inconstancy of fortune. Reason had informed him of the precarious condition of her gifts. Experience had satisfied him of their real value, he had enjoyed them without guilt, he might resign them without a sigh, and calmly disdain the impotent malice of his enemies, who had left him happiness, since they had left him virtue. From the earth, 
Boethius ascended to heaven in search of the supreme good. Explore the metaphysical labyrinth of chance and destiny, of prescience and free will, of time and eternity, and generously attempted to reconcile the perfect attributes of the deity with the apparent disorders of his moral and physical government. Such topics of consolation, so obvious, so vague, or so abstruse, are ineffectual to subdue the feelings of human nature. Yet the sense of misfortune may be diverted by the labor of thought, and the sage who could artfully combine in the same work the various riches of philosophy, poetry, and eloquence, must already have possessed the intrepid calmness which he affected to seek. Suspense, the worst of evils, was at length determined by the ministers of death, who executed and perhaps succeeded the inhuman mandate of Theodoric. A strong cord was fastened round the head of Boethius, and forcibly tightened till his eyes almost started from their sockets, and some mercy may be discovered in the milder torture of beating him with clubs till he expired. But his genius survived to diffuse a ray of knowledge over the darkest ages of the Latin world. The writings of the philosopher were translated by the most glorious of the English kings, and the third emperor of the name of Otho removed to a more honorable tomb the bones of the Catholic saint, who from his Arian persecutors had acquired the honors of martyrdom and the fame of miracles. In his last hours of Boethius, he derived some comfort from the safety of his two sons, of his wife and of his father-in-law, the venerable Symmachus. But the grief of Symmachus was indiscreet and perhaps disrespectful. He had presumed to lament he might dare to revenge the death of an injured friend. He was dragged in chains from Rome to the palace of Ravenna, and the suspicions of Theodoric could only be appeased by the blood of an innocent and aged senator. Humanity will be disposed to encourage any report which testifies the jurisdiction of conscience and the remorse of kings, and philosophy is not ignorant that the most hard specters are sometimes created by the powers of a disordered fancy and the weakness of a distempered body. After a life of virtue and glory, Theodoric was now descending with shame and guilt into the grave. His mind was humbled by the contrast of the past and justly alarmed by the invisible terrors of futurity. One evening, as it is related, when the head of a large fish was served on the royal table, he suddenly exclaimed that he beheld the angry countenance of Symmachus, his eyes glaring fury and revenge, and his mouth armed with long sharp teeth, which threatened to devour him. The monarch instantly retired to his chamber, and as he lay trembling with anguish cold under a weight of bedclothes, he expressed in broken murmurs to his physician Elpidius his deep repentance for the murders of Boethius and Symmachus. His malady increased, and after a dysentery which continued three days, he expired in the palace of Ravenna, in the thirty-third, or, if we compute from the invasion of Italy, in the thirty-seventh year of his reign. Conscious of his approaching end, he divided his treasures and provinces between his two grandsons, and fixed the Rhine as their common boundary. Amalaric was restored to the throne of Spain. Italy, with all the conquests of the Ostrogoths, was bequeathed to Athalaric, whose age did not exceed ten years, but who was cherished as the last male offspring of the line of Amali, by the short-lived marriage of his mother Amalasuntha with a royal fugitive of the same blood. In the presence of the dying monarch, the Gothic chiefs and Italian magistrates mutually engaged their faith and loyalty to the young prince, and to his guardian mother, and received, in the same awful moment, his last salutary advice to maintain the laws, to love the senate and people of Rome, and to cultivate with decent reverence the friendship of the emperor. The monument of Theodoric was erected by his daughter Amalasuntha in a conspicuous situation which commanded the city of Ravenna, the harbor, and the adjacent coast. A chapel of a circular form, thirty feet in diameter, is crowned by a dome of one entire piece of granite. From the center of the dome four columns arose, which supported in a vase of porphyry the remains of the Gothic king, surrounded by the brazen statues of the twelve apostles. His spirit, after some previous expiation, 
might have been permitted to mingle with the benefactors of mankind, if an Italian hermit had not been witness, in a vision, to the damnation of Theodoric, whose soul was plunged by the ministers of divine vengeance into the volcano of Lapari, one of the flaming mouths of the infernal world. End of chapter 39 Chapter 40, Part 1 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 40, Elevation of Justin the Elder, Reign of Justinian. 1. The Empress Theodora. 2. Factions of the Circus and Sedition of Constantinople. 3. Trade and Manufacture of Silk 4. Finances and Taxes 5. Edifices of Justinian Church of St. Sophia Fortifications and Frontiers of the Eastern Empire Abolition of the Schools of Athens and the Consulship of Rome The Emperor Justinian was born near the ruins of Sardica, the modern Sophia, of an obscure race of barbarians the inhabitants of a wild and desolate country, to which the names of Dardania, of Dacia, and of Bulgaria have been successively applied. His elevation was prepared by the adventurous spirit of his uncle, Justin, who, with two other peasants of the same village, deserted for the profession of arms the more useful employment of husbandmen or shepherds. On foot, with the scanty provision of biscuit in their knapsacks, the three youths followed the high road of Constantinople, and were soon enrolled, for their strength and stature, among the guards of the Emperor Leo. Under the two succeeding reigns, the fortunate peasant emerged to wealth and honors, and his escape from some dangers which threatened his life was afterwards ascribed to the guardian angel who watches over the fate of kings. His long and laudable service in the Isaurian and Persian wars would not have preserved from oblivion the name of Justin, yet they might warrant the military promotion which, in the course of fifty years, he gradually obtained, the rank of tribune, of count, and of general, the dignity of senator, and the command of the guards, who obeyed him as their chief at the important crisis when the emperor Anastasius was removed from the world. The powerful kinsmen whom he had raised and enriched were excluded from the throne, and the eunuch Amantius, who reigned in the palace, had secretly resolved to fix the diadem on the head of the most obsequious of his creatures. A liberal donative to conciliate the suffrage of the guards was entrusted for that purpose in the hands of their commander, but these weighty arguments were treacherously employed by Justinian in his own favor, and, as no competitor presumed to appear, the Dacian peasant was invested with the purple by the unanimous consent of the soldiers, who knew him to be brave and gentle, of the clergy and people, who believed him to be orthodox, and of the provincials, who yielded a blind and implicit submission to the will of the capital. The elder Justin, as he is distinguished from another emperor of the same name and family, ascended the Byzantine throne at the age of sixty-eight years, and, had he been left to his own guidance, Every moment of a nine years' reign must have exposed to his subjects the impropriety of their choice. His ignorance was similar to that of Theodoric, and it is remarkable that, in an age not destitute of learning, two contemporary monarchs had never been instructed in the knowledge of the alphabet. But the genius of Justin was far inferior to that of the Gothic king. The experience of a soldier had not qualified him for the government of an empire, and though personally brave, the consciousness of his own weakness was naturally attended with doubt, distrust, and political apprehension. But the official business of the state was diligently and faithfully transacted by the quaestor Proclus, and the aged emperor adopted the talents and ambition of his nephew Justinian, an aspiring youth whom his uncle had drawn from the rustic solitude of Dacia, and educated at Constantinople as the heir of his private fortune, and at length of the Eastern Empire. Since the eunuch Amantius had been defrauded of his money, it became necessary to deprive him of his life. The task was easily accomplished by the charge of a real or fictitious conspiracy, and the judges were informed, as an accumulation of guilt, that he was secretly addicted to the Manichaean heresy. 
Amantius lost his head. Three of his companions, the first domestics of the palace, were punished either with death or exile, and their unfortunate candidate for the purple was cast into a deep dungeon, overwhelmed with stones, and ignominiously thrown without burial into the sea. The ruin of Vitalian was a work of more difficulty and danger. That Gothic chief had rendered himself popular by the civil war which he boldly waged against Anastasius for the defense of the Orthodox faith, and after the conclusion of an advantageous treaty, he still remained in the neighborhood of Constantinople, at the head of a formidable and victorious army of barbarians. By the frail security of oaths, he was tempted to relinquish this advantageous situation, and to trust his person within the walls of a city, whose inhabitants, particularly the blue faction, were artfully incensed against him, by the remembrance even of his pious hostilities. The emperor and his nephew embraced him as the faithful and worthy champion of the church and state, and gratefully adorned their favorite with the titles of consul and general. But in the seventh month of his consulship, Vitellian was stabbed with seventeen wounds at the royal banquet, and Justinian, who inherited the spoil, was accused as the assassin of a spiritual brother, to whom he had recently pledged his faith in the participation of the Christian mysteries. After the fall of his rival, he was promoted, without any claim of military service, to the office of Master General of the Eastern Armies, whom it was his duty to lead into the field against the public enemy. But, in the pursuit of fame, Justinian might have lost his present dominion over the age and weakness of his uncle, and instead of acquiring by Scythian or Persian trophies the applause of his countrymen, the prudent warrior solicited their favor in the churches, the circus, and the senate of Constantinople. The Catholics were attached to the nephew of Justin, who, between the Nestorian and Eutychian heresies, trod the narrow path of inflexible and intolerant orthodoxy. In the first days of the new reign, he prompted and gratified the popular enthusiasm against the memory of the deceased emperor. After a schism of thirty-four years, he reconciled the proud and angry spirit of the Roman pontiff, and spread among the Latins a favorable report of his pious respect for the apostolic see. The thrones of the East were filled with Catholic bishops, devoted to his interest. The clergy and the monks were gained by his liberality, and the people were taught to pray for their future sovereign, the hope and pillar of the true religion. The magnificence of Justinian was displayed in the superior pomp of his public spectacles, an object not less sacred and important in the eyes of the multitude than the creed of Nicaea or Chalcedon. The expense of his consulship was esteemed at two hundred and eighty-eight thousand pieces of gold. Twenty lions and thirty leopards were produced at the same time in the amphitheater, and a numerous train of horses, with their rich trappings, was bestowed as an extraordinary gift on the victorious charioteers of the circus. While he indulged the people of Constantinople and received the addresses of foreign kings, the nephew of Justin assiduously cultivated the friendship of the Senate. That venerable name seemed to qualify its members to declare the sense of the nation and to regulate the secession of the imperial throne. The feeble Anastasius had permitted the vigor of government to degenerate into the form or substance of an aristocracy and the military officers who had attained the senatorial rank were followed by the domestic guards, a band of veterans whose arms or acclamations might fix in a tumultuous moment the diadem of the East. The treasures of the state were lavished to procure the voices of the senators, and their unanimous wish that he would be pleased to adopt Justinian for his colleague was communicated to the emperor. But this request, which too clearly admonished him of his approaching end, was unwelcome to the jealous temper of an aged monarch, desirous to retain the power which he was incapable of exercising. And Justin, holding his purple with both his hands, advised them to prefer, since an election was so profitable, some older candidate. Notwithstanding this reproach, the Senate proceeded to decorate Justinian with the royal epithet of nobilissimus, and the decree was ratified by the affection or the fears of his uncle. After some time, the languor of mind and body, to which he was reduced by an incurable wound in his thigh, indispensably required the aid of a guardian. He summoned the patriarch and senators, and in their presence solemnly placed the diadem on the head of his nephew, 
who was conducted from the palace to the circus, and saluted by the loud and joyful applause of the people. The life of Justin was prolonged about four months, but from the instant of this ceremony he was considered as dead to the empire, which acknowledged Justinian, in the forty-fifth year of his age, for the lawful sovereign of the East. From his elevation to his death, Justinian governed the Roman Empire thirty-eight years, seven months, and thirteen days. The events of his reign, which excite our curious attention by their number, variety, and importance, are diligently related by the secretary of Belisarius, a rhetorician whom eloquence had promoted to the rank of senator and prefect of Constantinople. According to the vicissitudes of courage or servitude, of favor or disgrace, Procopius successfully composed the history, the panegyric, and the satire of his own times. The eight books of the Persian, Vandalic, and Gothic wars, which are continued in the five books of Agathius, deserve our esteem as a laborious and successful imitation of the Attic, or at least of the Asiatic writers of ancient Greece. His facts are collected from the personal experience and free conversation of a soldier, a statesman, and a traveler. His style continually aspires, and often attains, to the merit of strength and elegance. His reflections, more especially in the speeches which he too frequently inserts, contain a rich fund of political knowledge, and the historian, excited by the generous ambition of pleasing and instructing posterity, appears to disdain the prejudices of the people and the flattery of courts. The writings of Procopius were read and applauded by his contemporaries, but, although he respectfully laid them at the foot of the throne, the pride of Justinian must have been wounded by the praise of a hero who perpetually eclipses the glory of his inactive sovereign. The conscious dignity of independence was subdued by the hopes and fears of a slave, and the secretary of Belisarius labored for pardon and reward in the six books of the imperial edifices. He had dexterously chosen a subject of apparent splendor, in which he could loudly celebrate the genius, the magnificence, and the piety of a prince, who, both as a conqueror and legislator, had surpassed the puerile virtues of Themistocles and Cyrus. Disappointment might urge the flatterer to secret revenge, and the first glance of favor might again tempt him to suspend or suppress a libel in which the Roman Cyrus is degraded into an odious and contemptible tyrant in which both the emperor and his consort Theodora are seriously represented as two demons who had assumed a human form for the destruction of mankind. Such base inconsistency must doubtless sully the reputation, and detract from the credit of Procopius. Yet, after the venom of his malignity has been suffered to exhale, the residue of the anecdotes, even the most disgraceful facts, some of which have been tenderly hinted in his public history, are established by their internal evidence, or the authentic monuments of the times. From these various materials, I shall now proceed to describe the reign of Justinian, which will deserve and occupy an ample space. The present chapter will explain the elevation and character of Theodora, the factions of the circus, and the peaceful administration of the sovereign of the East. In the three succeeding chapters, I shall relate the wars of Justinian, which achieved the conquest of Africa and Italy and I shall follow the victories of Belisarius and Narses, without disguising the vanity of their triumphs, or the hostile virtue of the Persian and Gothic heroes. The series of this volume will embrace the jurisprudence and theology of the emperor, the controversies and sects which still divide the Oriental Church, and the reformation of the Roman law, which is obeyed or respected by the nations of modern Europe. 1. In the exercise of supreme power, the first act of Justinian was to divide it with the woman whom he loved, the famous Theodora, whose strange elevation cannot be applauded as the triumph of female virtue. Under the reign of Anastasius, the care of the wild beasts, maintained by the green faction at Constantinople, was entrusted to Acacius, a native of the Isle of Cyprus, who, from his employment, was surnamed the Master of the Bears. This honorable office was given after his death to another candidate, notwithstanding the diligence of his widow, who had already provided a husband and a successor. Acacius had left three daughters, Comito, 
Theodora, and Anastasia, the eldest of whom did not then exceed the age of seven years. On a solemn festival, these helpless orphans were sent by their distressed and indignant mother, in the garb of suppliants, into the midst of the theatre. The green faction received them with contempt, the blues with compassion, and this difference, which sunk deep into the mind of Theodora, was felt long afterwards in the administration of the empire. As they improved in age and beauty, the three sisters were successfully devoted to the public and private pleasures of the Byzantine people, and Theodora, after following Kimito on the stage, in the dress of a slave, with the stool on her head, was at length permitted to exercise her independent talents. She neither danced, nor sung, nor played on the flute. Her skill was confined to the pantomime arts. She excelled in buffoon characters, and as often as the comedian swelled her cheeks, and complained with a ridiculous tone and gesture of the blows which were inflicted, the whole theatre of Constantinople resounded with laughter and applause. The beauty of Theodora was the subject of more flattering praise, and the source of more exquisite delight. Her features were delicate and regular. Her complexion, though somewhat pale, was tinged with a natural color. Every sensation was instantly expressed by the vivacity of her eyes. Her easy motions displayed the graces of a small but elegant figure, and either love or adulation might proclaim that painting and poetry were incapable of delineating the matchless excellence of her form. But this form was degraded by the facility with which it was exposed to the public eye and prostituted to licentious desire. Her venal charms were abandoned to a promiscuous crowd of citizens and strangers, of every rank and of every profession. The fortunate lover, who had been promised the night of enjoyment, was often driven from her bed by a stronger or more wealthy favorite, and when she passed through the streets, her presence was avoided by all who wished to escape either the scandal or the temptation. The satirical historian has not blushed to describe the naked scenes which Theodora was not ashamed to exhibit in the theater. After exhausting the arts of sensual pleasure, she most gratefully murmured against the parsimony of nature, but her murmurs, her pleasures, and her arts must be veiled in the obscurity of a learned language. After reigning for some time the delight and contempt of the capital, she condescended to accompany Echebolus, a native of Tyre, who had obtained the government of the African Pentapolis. But this union was frail and transient. Echebolus soon rejected an expensive or faithless concubine. She was reduced at Alexandria to extreme distress, and in her laborious return to Constantinople, every city of the East admired and enjoyed the fair Cyprian, whose merit appeared to justify her descent from the peculiar island of Venus. The vague commerce of Theodora, and the most detestable precautions, preserved her from the danger which she feared. Yet once, and once only, she became a mother. The infant was saved and educated in Arabia by his father, who imparted to him on his deathbed that he was the son of an empress. Filled with ambitious hopes, the unsuspecting youth immediately hastened to the palace of Constantinople, and was admitted to the presence of his mother. As he was never more seen, even after the decease of Theodora, she deserves the foul imputation of extinguishing with his life a secret so offensive to her imperial virtue. In the most abject state of her fortune and reputation, some vision, either of sleep or of fancy, had whispered to Theodora the pleasing assurance that she was destined to become the spouse of a potent monarch. Conscious of her approaching greatness, she returned from Paphlagonia to Constantinople, assumed, like a skillful actress, a more decent character, relieved her poverty by the laudable industry of spinning wool, and affected a life of chastity and solitude in a small house, which she afterwards changed into a magnificent temple. Her beauty, assisted by art or accident, soon attracted, captivated, and fixed the patrician Justinian, who already reigned with absolute sway under the name of his uncle. Perhaps she contrived to enhance the value of a gift which she had so often lavished on the meanest of mankind. Perhaps she inflamed, first by modest delays, and at last by sensual allurements, the desires of a lover, who, from nature or devotion, was addicted to long vigils and abstemious diet. When his first transports had subsided, 
she still maintained the same ascendant over his mind by the more solid merit of temper and understanding. Justinian delighted to ennoble and enrich the object of his affection. The treasures of the East were poured at her feet, and the nephew of Justin was determined, perhaps by religious scruples, to bestow on his concubine the sacred and legal character of a wife. But the laws of Rome expressly prohibited the marriage of a senator with any female who had been dishonored by a servile origin or a theatrical profession. The empress Lupicina, or Euphemia, a barbarian of rustic manners, but of irreproachable virtue, refused to accept a prostitute for her niece, and even Vigilantia, the superstitious mother of Justinian, although she acknowledged the wit and beauty of Theodora, was seriously apprehensive, lest the levity and arrogance of that artful paramour might corrupt the piety and happiness of her son. These obstacles were removed by the inflexible constancy of Justinian. He patiently expected the death of the empress. He despised the tears of his mother, who soon sunk under the weight of her affliction, and a law was promulgated in the name of the emperor Justin, which abolished the rigid jurisprudence of antiquity. A glorious repentance, the words of the edict, was left open for the unhappy females who had prostituted their persons on the theater, and they were permitted to contract a legal union with the most illustrious of the Romans. This indulgence was speedily followed by the solemn nuptials of Justinian and Theodora. Her dignity was gradually exalted with that of her lover, and as soon as Justin had invested his nephew with the purple, the patriarch of Constantinople placed the diadem on the heads of the emperor and empress of the East. But the usual honors which the severity of Roman manners had allowed to the wives of princes could not satisfy either the ambition of Theodora or the fondness of Justinian. He seated her on the throne as an equal and independent colleague in the sovereignty of the empire, and an oath of allegiance was imposed on the governors of the provinces in the joint names of Justinian and Theodora. The eastern world fell prostrate before the genius and fortune of the daughter of Acacius, the prostitute who, in the presence of innumerable spectators, had polluted the theater of Constantinople, was adored as a queen in the same city, by grave magistrates, orthodox bishops, victorious generals, and captive monarchs. End of chapter 40, part 1